Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here, uh, and really, it's, it's a, an honor to be with such great company and, and addressing so many of you to come out uh, to, to talk about this subject and how do we really increase placemaking in our communities. Donovan's talked about you know, how we work with our existing downtowns. I want to focus on the question of our suburbs, because quite frankly, our suburbs in general Many of them do a wonderful job of creating private, internalized places, our interiors of our homes, our own little lawns and gardens. But let's face it, that public realm of strip malls, of fast food joints, uh, you know, that is the public realm of most of our suburbs, and it's lousy. Um, so the fact that it's actually now getting old and starting to really underperform gives us an incredible opportunity to redevelop, retrofit, regreen, re-inhabit these places into really great places. So I'm not going to focus so much on all, all of the reasons why it makes sense to focus on redeveloping or retrofitting our suburbs. I think so many of our speakers are going to um, talk about, about a lot of these issues. And I'm, I, you know, I think I'm not going to talk much about the, the economic and real estate drivers behind this, because obviously Chris has really done, I think, a pretty a fantastic job um, already of, show, of talking about how the market has really shifted. But, also, but I do want to mention that those older suburbs, the first ring suburbs, it is important to recognize that as we have continued to sprawl, those older suburbs now have a relatively central location. And that is part of what they now, just like the downtowns, have the central location that often is what makes, helps to make a lot of economic sense um, for their redevelopment. What I'm going to do is dive into just as many um, case studies as I can cram into a short bit of time. When June and I wrote our book, we had about 80 case studies we were looking at. Our database now has over 600, and it's, n it's still not talking about everything. But we tend to organize the examples in terms of three basic strategies. And I, so re-inhabitation, redevelopment, and re-greening. And all three are essential to good placemaking. The re-inhabitation, reusing existing buildings, whether it's historic preservation, although frankly a lot of those suburban buildings, they're better off as adaptive reuse uh, than just, just you know, maintaining that beautiful historic strip mall. Um, but they provide us a fantastic opportunity for relocalization. Um, of that commercial landscape, which right now is dominated t typically by the sort of the chains, national chains, you get more local business when you're re-inhabiting. You get more local places. You can begin to grow, ret restore more of that local landscape, the native uh, vegetation and activities. Uh, we see this happening in all sorts of, of strategies, some, some of it's tactical urbanism, crowdsourcing, just things that volunteers, so often unsanctioned, are, are kind of doing to claim those spaces as our spaces. But we also see lots and lots of examples of whether it's dead big box, dying malls, being re-inhabited with more community serving uses. And they provide cheap space for the non-profits, the low profits, that make for a complete community. You don't want to redevelop everything. You want to have some of that cheap space. Um, and importantly, they create third places. This is a term that sociologist Ray Oldenburg uh, coined to describe if the first place is home, second place is work, the third place is where you go to just sort of chill, create community, build community, um, and relax. The suburbs were generally built assuming that every household was a family and that the social life result revolved around the schools. Now that, as Chris said, 75% of households don't have kids in them even in the suburbs. In the suburbs, we're, often, we're more like maybe 66%. Uh, but since the majority of homes don't ha have that social life centered on the school, there's a dearth of 
places for nightlife, places for just being more social and more public. So really quick, I'm gonna breeze through. Um, so the tactical urbanist strategies that just individuals going in, sometimes in small groups, doing everything from yarn bombing, one of my favorite. I don't know who it is who takes the time to knit cozies, to put on trees and parking meters and traffic lights, but studies show that when they do, crime goes down. It shows there have been eyes on the street. Someone has said, you know, this, this may, may not be much of a public space, but it's my public space, and I care about it. Um, uh, gorilla grafting, pl putting fruit, tr grafting fruit tree branches onto street trees, another absolutely amazing, I, I, I love these things. Short-term projects for long-term gains, they're great things. But then there's the more, the, the more substantial Reinhabitations. Uh, this is Willingboro Town Center in New Jersey. It was one of the original Levitt towns, and their strip, commercial strip, uh, as you see in the upper image, you know, just a bunch of big boxes laid out along the highway. They've now put in a town green in between two of the buildings, converted the old Woolworths into a library. They've now got some a job center. Um, a community college, you know, they've planted some bioswales on the, on the parking lots. The out, without really building anything new, they have created a true town center for a low-income community. Um, beautiful job. There are big box stores. I mean, there just are tons of examples um, of how they've been re-inhabited, whether it's with uh, churches, libraries, community centers, schools. Uh, in particular, one of the biggest trends has been, has been meds and eds. Lots of conversions into whether it's fitness centers or uh, medical centers. And, and as we're sort of bringing those services now out to the aging boomers um, out in the suburbs. So here's just a, a number of examples. Uh, and then the third places is another really interesting one. Uh, we're seeing quite a lot of strip malls that, in, as in this case, this was a, out in Oregon, a um, classic L-shaped grocery store anchored strip mall, but that as it was getting older, you know, it had been designed to be completely car-oriented convenience center. You drove there, you didn't hang out. Well, now this is the natural place to bring all of those restaurants and bars and the sort of places for those third places to allow those suburbanites that uh, that are looking for a little more social life to come so the owners in this case uh, they still have a grocery store but they cut two holes through the L. They made these sort of portals to the back because when you bring in the restaurants, you need that much more cafe space. You need more seating area. So they now turned what had been the back of the strip mall into a front, and they made those passageways between the front and the back into, as the upper left image shows, into these great outdoor rooms uh, such that now, People from the, the neighborhood that used uh, behind the strip mall can actually are walking there. They're biking there. Um, and one thing I noticed, you have a corridor study for Porter Avenue where you're demanding s concrete walls in between your commercial areas and your residential to protect your residential neighborhoods. And I would argue to, to think about this strategy instead of trying instead to make your commercial properties more porous, invite more connectivity rather than trying uh, to wall things off. So the re those are the, the re-inhabitation projects, I think, really help with that kind of social sustainability. Um, they, 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 they provide a lot of good things. But when you, if you're really trying to get sort of the triple bottom line of sustainability and placemaking, obviously redevelopment, where you're really going in and doing much more massive demolition and rebuilding uh, provides more, many more opportunities to urbanize those buildings, to organize the buildings, to really create connected outdoor rooms and walkable street networks. Because ultimately, that's what is so missing in the suburban fabric. In our downtowns, if you've got a walkable street grid, it's great to incrementally infill with buildings. But in our suburban areas, if we just replace one building at a time, 
we're not really creating a great place. We have to instill the infrastructure of walkable street grids and make those outdoor, that, then buildings that begin to frame those outdoor spaces. Um, and we need to reward that, that it also, rebuilding gives you an opportunity now to take suburban buildings that were designed to be seen by a car going 60 miles an hour to now reward the pedestrian eye. Much more fine grain of, of building, much more fine grain of craft, detail. Um, so lots of great, great opportunities with redevelopment. Um, one, there's about uh, 45 dead malls that have, have already been redeveloped as the downtowns that their suburbs never had. This is Belmar and Lakewood, uh, one of the furthest along. There's about another 60 in the pipeline. Uh, and it's a great example, as you can see in the, the uh, figure ground drawings on the, at the top there, the dead mall on the left is a classic sort of suburban form. The building is a discrete standalone object. It's just open space around it, dominated by cars, um, single uses. Whereas as they, they've rebuilt it, they took this 100 acre super block and they instead put a street grid through it. It's now 22 walkable blocks of publicly owned streets. Uh, the buildings are not cookie cutter. There's a diversity of housing choices. Um, and it's, it has an urban form. The buildings align and front onto the street. The blocks in the streets are smaller, more walkable. Um, it's, it's a great example. And, and it's inspired a lot more. We're also seeing examples of office parks getting infilled. Uh, in this case, this is one in, in Washington, D.C., where it, uh, it was, this was in, triggered by the arrival of transit, but a 1960s office park uh, was, you know, had never, nothing had really changed until transit came. And then the owner said, those surface parking lots surrounding my office buildings don't make sense anymore. Now I'll take advantage of a slope, build in a parking deck, and insert a new main street in between my office buildings. And then build in a, a infill with a lot more residential. So in that project, uh, the, the, the map on the upper right sort of shows all the new projects that are now, uh, that it has triggered around it. The shopping mall is now considering extending streets. Some of the apartment, garden apartment complexes have already been permitted uh, to go f uh, to eight and even 30 stories. But there is, so it's, it's a great example of, I think, showing you know, how the seeds of urbanism can be planted and, and trigger more. But it's also a cautionary tale. Um, urbanistically, I love what this project is doing, just infilling the existing sort of widely spaced office buildings with urbanism. But when I actually got there and walked the new Main Street, I was so disappointed. As the lower, le lower right image shows, they basically hired an architect who designed strip malls to design their Main Street. There's no sense of craft. There's no sense of detail. Um, they're really cheap and cheesy buildings. Um, I, I, I'm slightly comforted by the fact that they're so cheap, they'll probably be replaced in a few years. Um, but at least they got the urbanism right, and that is by far the more important um, example. Uh, just a, a, one more example of, of a dead mall, that, well, dying mall, in, that in this case uh, has triggered the development of an entire new downtown for a suburb outside of Vancouver in Surrey, and it happens to be on a transit line, so it's a transit-oriented development, a new downtown, and the whole thing is with a district energy system of geothermal. Um, district energy, I think there's so many opportunities to, to again, sort of move us um, into, uh, you know, diversify our energy sources as, as we look at things. Uh, now, in a, so in, but in addition to looking at what happens on the private pro property parcels, retrofitting is it's also absolutely fundamental that we look at what happens in the public right-of-way, in the corridors, and how we connect to places. And it starts with just looking at intersections. This is an example in Washington of uh, an intersection at Fort T uh, There's a metro station um, just off the well, metro station right here, and this intersection was designed with really wide turning radii for the car. 
very hard for a pedestrian to walk and cross that intersection, even though it's right near a metro. So DC planning has rebuilt it as a 90 degree intersection. In the process, they've recovered all that public land. They're giving it on a 99 year lease to a developer to build affordable urban housing at the intersection and really getting a great sort of win-win. Um, there's tools like the, the new ITE manual for designing walkable urban thoroughfares that now make it easy for engineers uh, to, do, to, to do this kind of thing. Another great example of, I think, rethinking intersections as public placemaking. This is a, a roundabout that was built for Normal, Illinois, a, a fairly small town at a five-way intersection. It also collects all the storm water from the neighboring streets to a cistern, filters them through a living machine that then makes it into potable water and creates a great public space um, there in the middle of what had been just a confusing intersection. Uh, but ultimately, it's also about really retrofitting our, the corridors themselves. I could give an entire lecture on just all the, the great thinking and, and projects that are going on on how we tackle the five-lane arterial, this ubiquitous with the suicide lane that's sort of everywhere. This is one of the best ones. Um, this was a main street for Lancaster, California. Here's the before, five lanes. They narrowed it down to two and put the parking in the middle. And then the parking is lined with street lights and trees. And then on festival days, they can eliminate the parking and it becomes a great Ramblas walking space. Um, they've got plenty of, of, of street traffic on the side roads. Uh, they've made a fantastic place. And the economic investment, since they did this, the businesses were extremely nervous. You're going to kill us. You're taking away traf lanes of traffic. You're going to kill us. No, they've seen sales absolutely skyrocket um, for all the reasons I think that Chris said. In, on corridors, again, raising the bar of our neighbors to the north, Vancouver, they're doing district energy as they uh, retrofit their corridors. So that changing their zoning to require that large buildings oversize their systems, they can sell their excess capacity. If you're heating a building during the day, as you're, you're mostly office, you can sell it at night to the new residential building that's just gone up. Um, and, and the city is doing some great things with that. But ultimately, all of that densification won't work everywhere. And sometimes it makes more sense to re-green these properties we never, if we never should have built there in the first place, which is often the case in a lot of, um, a, a lot of our suburbs. So the, there's also there's an opportunity to reconstruct the local ecology, to daylight streams that were culverted, and in the process to clean the runoff. Uh, there's an opportunity often to add parks Parks tend to increase property, adjacent property values by about 30%. So even though we tend to think of regreening as, oh, we're just doing it for ecological reasons, it often has a tremendous economic uh, benefit. We're seeing a lot of interest now and, and a lot of folks really in using some of those vacant parcels now for uh, food and energy production, carbon sequestration. There's lots of great things. Uh, golf courses were so overbuilt in the 90s and um, the market is shifting for all the reasons that Chris described, that golf courses are now being resold, in this case, into agriculture. Um, there's, there are uh, several golf courses that are now being turned in, rebuilt as only half courses, sort of with uh, senior housing, sort of as we're, sh again, watching those markets uh, shift and adapting to them. Uh, this is a great example up in Seattle where um, an existing mall that's still doing very well, but the mall had paved over the headwaters of a creek when it was built. And in order to be given permission to expand, the, they had to strike a deal to give up a third of their parking lot. So the parking, now there's a transit center on half of that, and then here they've daylit the creek, put in a huge bioswale, senior housing, mixed housing um, on this side, and turn suddenly now, this is a detail of that swale, um, turn the stuff that we used to just put into pipes underground, now becomes an amenity. 
the regreening is now a park space that is increasing the value um, of the housing around it at the same time that it's performing incredible eco services, cleaning runoff for about 600 acres uh, and adding a lot of uh, increase in property values. Uh, one last example of regreening this one is of a dead downtown mall. We built an enormous number of malls in our downtown, sort of at the end of urban renewal in the 1970s, as a lot of downtowns were trying to compete with the suburbs. We built suburban-style malls, but in our downtowns. Those are failing at an even higher rate than the suburban malls, which about a third are dead or dying. Um, so in this case, uh, during the recession, Columbus, Ohio demolished their downtown mall and put in a park and with the hope that the park would eventually, as the economy recovered, they could ring it with urban housing. In November, they just broke ground on the, on the first new urban housing to go up around the park. And they're seeing much better, again, increases in property values, um, as well as now having this great public amenity. So uh, lastly, then, you know, that's just sort of a handful, tip of the iceberg, of some of the different sort of strategies, different kinds of projects that people are, are doing around the country. I think some of the next steps are we need to target retrofitting even more strategically at the metro scale. And there are, in the strong markets in DC and in, in Austin, uh, we're seeing some of this, but where you really do it, an audit of where are all the underperforming properties, the vacant lots, uh, the, the vacant parking, parking lots, and then determine which should we target for regreening because there's an ecological reason we really never should have built there um, and, and we need those, that green infrastructure. Which should we target for redevelopment because they're close to where the transit, the employment centers are? And then which should we also target for re-inhabitation to try to preserve that space for the entrepreneurs, uh, the mom and pop shops, the local nonprofits? And so that's, I think, um, we're starting to see more and more of that at the metro scale. We also need to continue to develop and to make more use of some of the new tools that are out there, form-based codes, transfer of development rights, health impact assessments, um, as well as a number of tools that are being developed sort of to in look at the retrofitability uh, and ranking of, of different sites, grayfield audits. Um, and I would also say one of the important next steps, really my dream, um, I think that this country has basically relied on our default model of affordable housing has been drive till you qualify. Now in small towns, it doesn't, you're not driving a long distance, but in our large metros, that means the, the, the poor, the lower incomes, middle class are all getting pushed further and further out. And yet, because that's where you get more housing for your buck. But the savings associated with that cheaper housing are more than eaten up by the additional transportation costs, usually after about 10 miles. And so the system is broken, and yet, no one really does the math. We have to do a better job in this country of connecting affordable housing with affordable transportation. And I think we do that by redeveloping more of our suburban corridors. We have tons of land and underperforming properties that really could become wonderful corridors that actually are become a proud address. Um, if we can line them with transit and convert them to boulevards. Finally, if you, uh, I would say next steps, if you're interested in any of this, please come to the Congress for the New Urbanism 21. We're in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm, I'm chair of the board. We have uh, uh, more, over a dozen initiatives that are really getting into the nitty gritty on all of this stuff, and we would love to partner with you and, and have you come and join us. But thank you very much.